Ja, ja, sehen. Okay, um, it's very hard for me to properly credit Azim, uh, but uh, I'll just say that he's probably one of the most um, well, well respected uh, analysts in the, in the UK, if not the world, 200,000 at least people reading him every day. Um, and um, the funny thing is that we've kind of never met before, but we kind of feel like we're always on the same wavelength. This is the first time I'm talking to you while I'm wearing trousers, Horace. Uh, so. <laughs> well, you don't know what I'm wearing. Um, so, so the thing is that we've always kind of hit it off on, on our conversations. We get started on a podcast. We get started on, a, on even a prep call. And like we go on for, uh, uh, for at least half an hour on, on tangents. And um, I said, well, we gotta, we got to discuss this big topic of micromobility, which I know you're a great fan of. You wrote a great book called Exponential. First, tell us about that and, and kind of what you're thinking overall is how do you, how do you frame thinking about all these topics, tech and so on? Yeah, no, well, thank you. And, uh, you know, I followed your work since perhaps you just left Nokia. So it's been a, mm -hmm. uh, a long while of reading. Uh, 2010. A, a CEO, yeah. And, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the book, I think the book reflects something that everybody here knows, which is the world today from a technology change perspective, feels really different to just 15 years ago. Uh, and there was a period, some point between 2013 and I think 2016, 2017, where a bunch of trends became really manifest. Like the world's largest companies were not car companies, they were tech companies. Or energy, you know, Exxon. Or energy, right, yeah. right, exactly. Uh, Exxon, Chevron, and, and Conoco. Um, but at the same time, you saw solar power being the cheapest form of electricity. And uh, in the world, that was about 2016. Just this afternoon, Bloomberg New Energy Finance have said that 2017, they, their data now shows, was peak internal combustion engine car. Mm. And so there was some moment, some, when you look at these uh, exponential curves, it's like this smooth shifting uh, gradient. Where is there an inflection point? Because we can all see it. And I think that that was that inflection point. And how I think about it is fundamentally, technologies that are getting uh, cheaper at some point crossing a threshold where they are better than alternatives. And with that price performance comes greater ubiquity, greater modularity, greater composability, and greater decentralization. And then from that, what can we build? Right, so this is an interesting dichotomy, decentralized versus centralized, modular versus integrated. Now, the thing that we kind of began to debate was, I'm a big advocate of cities as the construct that we need to think of in terms of mobility. And cities uh, have a 5,000, actually 10,000 year old history. Um, so even before the Babylonians, uh, people were, were, were assembling in groups that were effectively there because the land was, was prosper, what would allow them to prosper beyond subsistence. And that's where you got together to trade, to craft, to build, to, to meet each other. So the, the city is such an important construct, but it, it also implies that people are closer together. And as a result, the types of trips that we take are in, in, you know, more frequent and they're also shorter. Now, the thing that we're, we're struggling with this is that there's another tendency for us to work from home. There's a tendency for us to be, let's say, decentralized in many ways. Tell me what you think was gonna happen to cities, because I'm very, I'm sort of, I, I, you know, I, again, I, I think cities are invincible, cities are forever, and we've become uh, an urban species. Right. What's the future going to be? We, we have, and uh, we are so urban that even in France, 80% of the population is urban. Uh, and that, for me, is a, is a marker, right? Because France is sort of famous as a European country, a kind of rural country with a strong farming heritage. You look at the invulnerability of cities, um, Hiroshima, had a nuclear bomb drop on it uh, on, in 1945. Within 10 years, it was back to the same economic output and then the, the population peaked at two million in the early 1970s. So they're really, really, really resilient. And the question is, what happens now? There are these forces of attraction that you talked about, which was larger markets, lower transport costs, ability to specialize economically. It's why for thousands of years, people who live in the countryside move to the city. But there are forces of repulsion as well because you have higher crime, higher, higher pollution, higher stress levels, less, less social contact. So I think that there are three 
um, slightly contradictory forces that are playing in, in cities right now. The, the, the first is that the, the argument for um, bigger and bigger cities was really driven by this idea of, of agglomeration. If we can all come together, we can specialize. And the modern economy needs specialization. That's what biotech is, it's what battery chemistry is, it's what machine learning is. You can only specialize when there are large numbers of people. And, and that would force clusters, call it Silicon Valley, call it Shenzhen, call it New York for finance. But recent research that's just come out in the last month or two uh, has shown that since the mid-2000s, the arrival of digital collaboration tools have enabled distributed advanced research that we thought had to take place in mm. cities to, to, to be effect, as effective, weakening one of the reasons for people to, to group yeah, in But here's my point, though. We may have gotten together for some reasons, like you mentioned, right. collaboration, work, and we think of work as something that you have to come together for, and work is becoming less centralized. But at the same time, the sense of community is, I mean, it's not just work that brings people in the same place. Let's take this venue, for example, or this whole part of Amsterdam. This was manufacturing. We're in, a, we're in a factory right now, building ships and or engines for ships. But the point about it, this whole area got redeveloped into something new. It's, it's vibrant and attracting more and more people. So, We've actually gone post-industrial, and yet we've still grown urban utilization, if you will. But, you know, Amsterdam is a tiny, tiny city, right? Amsterdam is, is not going to be representative, right? So, so I think that the, the second trend that we need to think about is when we talk about cities, the, the cities, these beautiful older cities that we see in Europe, which are the, you know, amongst my favorite in the world, um, are not, as you know, representative at all of, of where the urban human will live in 30 or 40 years. But still, the, the way that cities are defined changes across. Obviously, uh, when, you, when, you, when, you, when I cite these figures from the United Nations, it's because the United Nations pulls uh, from every country their yeah. own data, and each country gets, a, gets its own definition. So in America, city is very much a sprawl. Right. In, 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 in maybe in, in India, it's different. Maybe in Europe, it's different. But, but here's my point. Even in this sprawling city in the United States, you have a, a need for people to come together, and they do so for social and and for for community building reasons. And there's a there's a there's a, a they call them urban villages. Yeah. So you you end up therefore really with these clumps of shops and or uh, walkable areas surrounded by possibly you know uh, a sprawling uh, uh, single family housing. Right. But, but, so it, it varies around the world, but the idea that we all live together is, 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 a, is a very common theme because we just need company. We need to be near each other. I think there's nothing more terrorizing. People, people think about the farms mm. and, the, and the country cottage as somehow being idyllic. You yeah. spend the night there alone and you'll see how what fear feels like. You know, it's, it's not at all comfortable to be alone. You, you know, but there was a trade-off and I think up, up until now, the trade-off was between that sense of so sociality and communality, which was also about connectedness to who you are and who your, what your identity was, what your, your heritage was, how far your family was from you, and the need to get a, uh, a knowledge age job in a law firm or a pharma research business. And essentially, you had to leave your town, which was a city, to go to the local university cluster or the big big city. You may not have to do that now because of yeah. distributed work. Fair enough, fair enough, and, and, education. And, and so what we're able to do is get the communality that we so desire and the sociability and the economic opportunity, which was the trade-off that we've yeah. lived in. I, I, in I still of the think US we want to have physically, physical, physical proximity. But let's, that's yeah. what we've been talking about, developed, wealthy country. Right. Let's talk about what's really driving urbanization globally, and that's your, you know, growing economies. So, you, you know, there, there's the, you know, I sometimes challenge people to name the 40 fastest growing yeah. cities in the world and hardly anybody has ever been there or has heard of them if you live in the, in the, in the wealthy part of the world. And so these are places in Africa, places in, in Asia, places in South America. 10 million is the threshold for a mega city and there are more than 40 mega cities in the world today. And most of them you've never heard of. Well, the one we were discussing this afternoon, uh, Blantyre City. I never heard of it. Um, Me neither. 
40 million people forecast in that city by the end of the century. Uh, it's currently 800,000. It's and, the second. And 40 million, 40 million, just put that in perspective, yeah. is today the largest city in the world, which is the, the New Delhi, Delhi area. Right. And that's the second largest city in Malawi. So it's, and that is where we see this, uh, this growth happening. And I think the, one of the questions will be, these are huge markets. Um, they're markets where people will need mobility. Where will that form, form of that mobility come from? Um, there are also markets where, for now, the things that allow cities like Austin and Cincinnati to develop high-tech, exponential age industries, which is human capital investment in, in education and, right. and finance and IP rights and, uh, and the lawyers that you need <laughs> around all of that, don't yet exist in those sub-Saharan and Asian countries. And so they may fall, follow a pattern that looks a lot like the one that we've seen here. In the 1920s and in 30s. In the 1920s and 30s, right. Exactly. In order to grow, everyone is going to have to physically co-locate in these conurbations of 30, 40, I think that the West is going to stabilize at some, and you did mention still that means 80%. Right. Maybe it's going to lose a little, and even auto, auto, uh, uh, the number of cars in use, uh, the, uh, the motorization rate is going to start to decrease in the West. Yeah. But, but there's so much demand everywhere else. And, and this is one of the things that I keep pounding on is that, is that we, if you are thinking micromobility, you have to be thinking about the, the low end of the market. You have to be thinking about emerging economies. Right. And, and we're talking hundreds of millions of new users. And we're talking two wheels as the primary uh, number of wheels on the vehicle. So, but, but the, to, to this question then, you know, Malawi, 40 million people in one city. Right. Mexico City, by the way, you've probably heard of. It's a mega city. It's 25 Europe, million today, right? It, it, two. Yeah, 25 million. Istanbul is the biggest city in Europe if you can call it European, because it's kind of straddling Europe and Asia. Um, Cairo is a huge city, it's outgrew its boundaries. It's like wrapping itself around the pyramids now. Right. If you think it's idyllic desert, no, it's masses of people. And the, the question I think for those, for those cities is to the extent to which they can uh, plan and manage their, their growth, do they want to grow in a world of long distance commuting that is driven by pouring concrete or, or high, speed, high speed rail? Or do they want to find some way of growing where the journeys can remain short, right? Sub five kilometers. Because if they can do that, they put themselves on a path that's much more sustainable All right. than if they have to pour concrete. So let me pass by you a thesis, because yeah. we've been developing this here uh, at Micromobility Industries, and we're calling it Infinite Cities. The premise is this, that there's a confluence of trends. One is mass urbanization. The other, though, is that we're going to have increasingly more micromobility. We're also going to have uh, the, the, the new technology for wearables and the new technology for, for effectively creating a, a, a virtual universes mm -hmm. right bef before our eyes, whether we're indoors or out, which would completely allow us to reshape the, the environment outside. And we're having crypto technologies which allow cities to reorganize themselves uh, according to how they allocate resources. Now, we don't know how that's going to really work out, but the idea that these three things are roughly at the same time hitting cities. You have a population of 40, 50 million people in one city who's therefore mayor will have a larger constituency than a lot of countries. Then that landscape, that cityscape is going to be suddenly virtualized in three dimensions. And on top of that, you're going to be able effectively to redesign how to vote and reallocate resources. Yeah. So that's our thesis. Now, we don't know what that leads us to. Can, but, I, can I just add yeah. some extra layers to that, right? So you talked about those three technologies, but there are other things that are going on. So within, um, within energy, we will be moving towards, uh, currently the way energy works is that you spend a few billion dollars and you build a massive gas power station on the coast, generate a huge amount of um, uh, uh, electrical output and you pipe it across long distance lines. Future energy will have a big, big mix that includes decentralized rooftop, commercial grade solar, small wind farms, small modular reactors, 
delivered with storage and storage storage that will be um, grid scale and utility scale batteries and virtual batteries stringing together the the the, the, the unused capacity in our i threes as well as modular microgrids that live within cities as opposed to national or regional grids. You'll also start to see the arrival of um, urban vertical farms uh, and precision fermentation, which will mean that the food products from uh, vegetables and, and, and you know, proteins being able to be built within the city rather than as happens today. Right. I order a tomato for delivery in, the, in, in London two days later. It's still in the ground in Spain when I click add to basket. And, and then even going down to industrial products, right? the means of manufacturing could start to shift towards additive 3D printing, but the production of feedstocks will, will start to change. And, and you know, just a few weeks ago, I was talk a few days ago, I was talking to um, the CEO of Lanzatech, which takes CO2 out of industrial processes and potentially out of the atmosphere through a bunch of um, bacteria and turns it into ethanol, which is a pre-feed for the production of things like polyester, which of course we need as an industrial sure. material types of po and polythene. And her plants, her industrial process does not require huge semi-city scale industrial chemical plants of the type we're used to. These are the size of two football fields. They're the size of this building. Mm. So they can live near or in cities. So to add to your metaverse technologies and your crypto is also the stack of industrial processes and food processes from energy to materials to protein to uh, vegetables yeah. that will start to, in some sense, be able to be run within the city for the first time, frankly, since 7000 BC when we first settled in Chatelhoyuk in, in right. what is now modern day Turkey. So the, the, the process here of, and uh, you, you talk about decentralization, decentralization and, and centralization, but in many ways what we're seeing therefore is that the independence of the city from the land, from energy, from point sources to distribute it that actually benefits the city. So this is the thing. Politically, what that means, as I said, I started with this question of what does the mayor mean now? Right. Politically, what that means is that suddenly there's a huge shift in power because the, the, the countryside was very much like, well, yeah, but this is where food comes from. This is where energy comes from. Right. This is where manufacturing comes from. There's only cities like, well, we're doing all right, thank you. And so, so it's fascinating how that might actually very, in a very short amount of time, tip the scales towards maybe a, the city-state coming back as really a powerhouse politically. And that means we, the providers of mobility, stand to be much more important than the Department of Transportation at the federal level that stipulates highway rules. Well, you know, you're already starting to see uh, mayors take that lead. So when it, there's this thing called the C40, which is the coalitions of, of mayors looking at questions of climate change and climate resilience of which this is this is part of it so the tre that trend is is emerging and i think that the, the the balance that battle is one that we have seen in the past right when economic and industrial power shifts to a new group they start to be able to secure better rights we saw that happen in the 1890s to the 1920s as workers moved from moved into factories and started to get through the fordist bargain higher wages 10 to 15 years later, we started to see stronger welfare bargains in the US, in Europe, uh, from employment, employers' liability insurance to sick pay and a whole bunch of other things. So you would expect that to happen. Now, whether it goes as far as the city-state, where the state is the ultimate arbiter and protector of us as citizens, the thing we ask for our state is protect us from harm. It's your first mm -hmm. ordinance. I don't know if we'll necessarily go as far as that, but I do see there being a real battle between mayors starting to say, we need more power devolved to us, mm. more ability to raise taxes, more ability to regulate locally, mm. more ability to enforce than we currently have. And how that plays out, I think will really I mean, vary. It plays out in, 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 in a very concrete way with, 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 with transportation. 
So I'll give an example. I was told this. I, I, I didn't confirm it, but I was told that in Germany, for example, cities didn't have the right to stipulate how much parking would cost. The parking was something that only at a federal level. And they lobbied for changes because they said that actually that it, it, it's a subsidy for the automobile. Right. And they were granted this eventually through the process. But you have this tug of war between, like, we need a lot more local power than, than, than exists today. And, and, and you can't say no to somebody who actually is, is, the, is the leader of 40 million people if that's the you know, scale you're dealing with. And, you know, cities, the city mayors are also closer to the customer, right? So there is something that is undeniable about individuals buying e-bikes mm. that is so different from a national government level ordinance. And I, I think about the difference between you know, technology companies in the 70s and 80s where they, they did a technology push. I was Tony, talking to Tony Fidel from uh, Nest, but you know, previously at General Magic, and he said, you know, one of the problems with General Magic was we never cared about what the customer wanted. We just built this thing, and of course, that's not the way you guys are building your your bikes and your scooters. You are getting close to the customer from a democratic perspective. Who's closer to the customer? The mayor, the city councillor, or someone sitting in a federal government? Exactly. 500 miles away. And, and that, I think, is quite important. That, 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 that's a trend that I just feel that, as I'm, I'm not a political scientist, but I just feel that the numbers seem to suggest we're going in that direction. I think the, the, the consequences will be profound, and I think we need to start becoming leaders when, as, as people who are uh, building micromobility become leaders in guiding those in power as to what is the... Uh, the uh, uh, infrastructures we need and, and define those for them. Because I think that's where, this is where the leadership is now. You, you know, there's, I think there's a really, um, we can get optimistic for a moment, right? This idea that um, you know, in many countries, people feel deeply disengaged with their politics. And certainly in, in the UK and the US, which are the countries that you know, I follow most closely, so much of the political debate is miles away from what actually matters to people. Right now, we're arguing in the UK about whether we should move from the metric system, kilograms, meters, really? through back to the imperial system, which is a rod, which is 22 feet, and a foot is 30.3 centimeters. Who needs this? Um, yet, there are real questions about people's lives that actually matter. Transport being one of them, safety yeah. being another, clean air being a third. And this shift, I think, which is, and it may seem, you know, when you see a, an e-scooter e or an e-bike, that is part of the mechanism of this shift of people's yeah. attention turning to things that matter in their everyday. This is a power of the small, the power of, of, of the granular versus the macro, and, and so the distinction between macro, macro and micro. And so I think we're speaking about uh, a, a very similar uh, um, th beliefs here, but I want to go back to your initial question about what are the f forces that are pulling us apart, and um, and and so you know, so how does the COVID pandemic, which by the way generally benefited, I think a lot of crypt uh, a lot of uh, micro, it 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 just uh, allowed us to see the space the cars take, but at the same time it made people work at home, and many are never going to go back. Right. So the now, that means that the job of commuting is on the decline in, in, in many places. But at the same time, I think it's going to be replaced by the job of travel or uh, uh, journeys for pleasure or for social reasons. By the way, the reason I'm confident of this is because of this thing called Marchetti's Constant that right. says that we spend an hour a day in transportation. So suddenly, let's say, that means three trips a day on average. And suddenly, I don't have to take two of those. I, I, I no longer have to go to work. So that means that I'm taking one trip a day, which actually doesn't make sense. That means you're taking two trips every other day, right? I'm going to the store or somewhere. And that would be nice, wouldn't it? You will think it's great. But you're going to get antsy. You're going to say, man, this is boring sitting at home. So what people will do is they'll fill up that time and fill up those journeys with other things to do. They'll go and have you know, more exercise. They'll have more shopping experiences. They'll hang out with yeah. friends. And so my point is that Regardless of whether we're being pulled apart, the demand for transport, and, and that means mostly getting together. You know, Nokia used to be called connecting people. Connecting people. Well, micromobility is connecting people. And so if that's the case, then you may, maybe it's not in the city center, the classic kind of, mm. you know, zooming into all one place, but it would be like 
bunches of people getting together on the periphery. Yeah, and, and you, again, coming back to what mayors are doing, I think what you start to see uh, even before the COVID pandemic was a recognition to give people places to come together. So yeah. Barcelona introduced its, um, its super blocks. Yep. Uh, Paris had the 15 minute city, the idea of having things that are within 250 meters of your, of your home or a 15 minute commuting distance for everything that you need. And these are trends that I think were uh, in, behaviors that were emerging as a result of realizing that cities that were based on cars moving at 11 kilometers an hour or 15 kilometers an hour in London's case was not satisfactory as a life quality of life measure for their people. And so one of the things that will be interesting will be to see how the micro mobility players relate to the planners on a city by city basis to support those architectural changes because they require the pouring of concrete. So where I live in London um, uh, is uh, just off a road called the Finchley Road. And there is this um, roundabout, which is called the Swiss Cottage Roundabout. No one knows why it's called the Swiss Cottage Roundabout, but there is a terrible pub there not to be visited. And um, it's, it's a really complicated junction, which has the second or first worst air quality anywhere in Europe, depending on the time of year. And the, for years, the planners have tried to cut that down and make it a huge cycle lane and force the cars to go around a little bit of a detour. And they have succeeded prior to the pandemic. And so again, for somebody who's an optimist about these things, I think sometimes these trends are already in place. And when micromobility comes around, it, it adds succor and support to de brave decisions that politicians yeah, have taken. I, I would use the word it enables. In other words, it's like, you, you might say it causes it, but there's multi, multiple, multiple causes. causes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So this is the trouble with causality is often, we, you know, we say this, this is the reason, but it's one of the many reasons. But when, when you think about like, you know, the change we've had socially because of social media, well, it was enabled by the smartphone. It was enabled even by the internet. It was enabled by cellular and all these other technologies. But then when you say, and mayors will have to come around to this, well, we have, as Segway said, 15 million vehicles have been you know, shipped by one company, electric vehicles. Now that's gonna be multiplied by 10 and then by 10 again. We're gonna be looking at billions of these vehicles in the streets. We're going to be looking at hundreds of millions of avid users, satisfied users, which everyone is trying to enable. And that is what changes. That is the tail that wags the dog, which, which is why one of my, my, my thesis is that you know, there's a chicken and egg problem with, with infrastructures. Do you build it and they will come, or do you, do, you, do you start creating demand because the vehicle comes and then suddenly you need to build roads yeah. for it? And it turns out, here's a funny thing about automobiles, they actually, they were preceded by bicycles, and it was bicycles that came with pneumatic tires, and people said, we can't have cobblestones, we want to have a smooth pavement for us to ride our bicycles. Right. It led to the United States to call it something called the Good Roads Movement. Um, and, and then once the roads were built and the car was again, uh, uh, developed, they suddenly had infrastructure. Yeah. So, so who, who caused what? And that's why I think micro is such an exciting area is because it allows us to sort of suddenly dump on the world uh, so much more demand for better infrastructure and it just becomes a fed accompli. It's like, okay, we've, of course we have can, to can have I, it. Can I, can I just a practical question for the micro mobility operators here? Do they, ha to what extent can they, do they need to think of particular city conditions and city readiness uh, in their segmentation as they think about how they go to market and the point at which they want to actually actively engage with, you know, a city council or a mayor around how you shape whatever infrastructure mm -hmm. is, is required. You know, the way that automobility car sharing did this 10 years ago was that they came out and said, we're going to move fast and we're just going to steamroller and essentially mm -hmm. largely cookie cutter city by city. Um, and that doesn't seem to be the environment we want now. So right. how would you, what would you well, recommend to a so micro the, 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 This is a question about what is the decision process of a city? Yeah. Is, it, is it going to respond more to being effectively bulldozed or is it going to respond more to being 
kindly asked with mm. hat in hand. I think that the, the, it's a somewhere in between, but the, the fundamental thing is not to get into a fight. That's not ever going to work out. What, what needs to happen is to say, I have satisfied customers, I am doing a great deal for the city, and I think my customers are your constituents, and they're the most, uh, let's say, economically interesting, uh, let's say, demographically interesting audience you want to have. And they are my supporters. And let's find a way to bring along the laggards. Let's find a way to bring along those folks who are resisting change, which every, everyone has those constituents. And that's the problem. You know, we as business people, we like to think about the S-curve, early, middle, late. But if you're, if you're a city person, if you're in government, you don't distinguish. Right. They all get a vote. Right. Whether you're early or late, and whether you're poor or rich, and that's the problem, is that they cannot sequence change and say, well, fine, I'm going to provide a solution for the young today because they're there early, and I'm going to wait. No, you ha when it comes to infrastructure, it all has to happen at once. It's a challenge. I understand. These are two separate universes, but we have to work s somehow to convince them. And, and the magic happens sometimes, you know. That, that, and by the way, the other thing they respond to is examples where elsewhere people are prosperous and there's a lot of YOLO here, you know, yeah. uh, a but lot you, of envy. But on, the, on that point, I mean, I do also talk to uh, city uh, mayors and officials over the, the, the course of the year. And the thing that has really shifted in the last four or five years has been a willingness to be proactive and responsive around how you need to change ordinances and regula uh, regulation, even if it's experimental. Mm. There is still a risk, a real practical risk, that um, they get a little bit uh, astonished by smart technology, yeah. right? That an open AI demo can be the thing that captivates them. Yeah. And, and that, that tension, which is a sort of battle between the autonomous vehicle movement saying, make the changes we need so that our AVs can drive down the roads, will be vying for attention and the white heat of technology uh, with the, the people in this room who are saying auto rickshaws, car, e-cargo bikes, e-mopeds with swappable batteries. And that to me is a, something that we have to sort of figure well, out. We'll figure it out at an even higher level. I think we're going to figure out on, on, on the mass movement. We'll figure it out on celebrity endorsements. We'll figure it out on federal and international levels, which actually will, will sort of pincer movement on the city because we're coming can, can from Can I ask below? you one more question? Yeah. You wanted your celebrity endorsement. Who do you want? Who's your pick of the celebrity to endorse? I'll tell you who I want. I want, I want Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger because he loves bikes. And also, he's, he's, he's not particularly left or right, and he's, down, you know, he's, he's California plus Europe. He's, he's, uh, he's an advocate for electric uh, everything, so I think he'd be great. But I, I'm open to a lot of suggestions. Yeah, I, I don't have any good suggestions. I, I, for me, it would normally be a Kardashian only because that's the one people seem to talk about, but maybe it's the wrong <laughs> Maybe profile. that's fine. That's fine, too. Um, I think we're out of time. We are yeah. going to get kicked off. So thanks, uh, everybody. Thank